Chapter 27, God Ordains Sickness and Disease. Another of the signs used by God and frequently misunderstood today is that of physical healing. The misconception that God cannot or will not cause sickness must be addressed. Many people have erroneously concluded that all sickness originates with the devil. Thus, they further surmise that God's will for a person never includes sickness. Searching the scriptures helps the student of the Bible to arrive at the correct position concerning this matter. Consider the three following biblical truths concerning illness and healing. Number one, not all sickness is a result of present sin, unbelief, or being out of God's will. Jesus' own words concerning the blind from birth would prove this truth. John 9, 1. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man that was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. This man was born blind so that the works of God could be seen by all. God was glorified because of this illness. Number two, the Lord can cause the sickness and death of a child because of the sin of his father. Second Samuel twelve thirteen. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. Howbeit, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. And Nathan departed into his house. And the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. God can cause an incurable disease is the third one. 2 Chronicles 21, 14. Behold, with a great plague will the Lord smite thy people, thy children, thy wives, and all thy goods. And thou shalt have great sickness by disease of thy bowels until thy bowels fall out by reason of the sickness day by day. Continuing into verse 18. 2 Chronicles 21, 18, And after all this, the Lord smote him in his bowels with an incurable disease. And it came to pass that in the process of time, after the end of two years, his bowels fell out by reason of his sickness, so he died of sore diseases. And his people made no burning for him like the burning of his fathers. These three passages clearly illustrate the false teaching of claiming that God wants everyone healthy. The will of God, even for a Christian, may include sickness. However, some preachers reject the plain teaching of Scripture by teaching that all sickness occurs because someone is out of the will of God. Here are seven biblical reasons for sickness. Number one, for God's glory, John 11, 1 through 4. Number two, because of sin, Romans 1, 27. Number three, rejection of truth, 2 Chronicles 26, 18 through 21. Number four, caused by others, Philippians 2, 25 through 30. Number five, to teach humility, 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. Number six, to teach a lesson, Acts 13, 11. Number seven, God's testing and glory, Job 2, verse 3 and 5 through 8. The conditions of the last days. Perilous are the conditions of the last day. Their description is found in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 8. But in verse 8, a most unique comparison is made. The men who love their own selves, etc., likened to two of Pharaoh's magicians, Jannes and Jambres. Historically, these magicians withstood Moses by duplicating the signs and miracles of God. Sadly, the same conditions are prevalent in the last days. 2 Timothy 3, 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses, and lead captive, silly women, and laden with sins, led away with diverse lust, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Jannes and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. Historically, these magicians withstood Moses and resisted the truth by seeking to duplicate Moses' signs and wonders with false signs and wonders. The book of Exodus gives the actual account of Jannes and Jambres working their enchantments. Exodus 7:11. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers. Now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. For they cast down every man his rod, 
and they became serpents, but Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. God used signs. Satan's workers duplicated these miracles. The same holds true in the New Testament times. God used signs and wonders to confirm his word in the age of the apostles, but that which was a sign from God can also be used as an enchantment from Satan. Later in the same chapter of Exodus, we see the result of these false signs and miracles. The people's hearts hardened against the will of God, Exodus 7:22. And the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened, neither did he hearken unto them as the Lord had said. There are many indicators that man is living in the last days of the church age. Because of the folly of false miracle workers, many hearts have been similarly hardened toward the things of God. There has never been a more spiritually cold time in the modern era. The truth no longer seems to matter. The if it feels good, do it philosophy runs rampant, while what saith the Lord is virtually disregarded. Self-gratification and the love of money are two predominant ruling forces today. Therefore, the truth of God's word has been corrupted to make men think that God wants Christians to prosper mentally and emotionally, spiritually, and as it pertains to our health, always prosper physically. This is just not true. Although sickness may be God-ordained, or at least God-allowed, the following verse remains a good prayer. 3 John 2, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. As is evident from the scripture, God can and will use sickness to reveal his will and glory. Any person or group who claims that God's will never includes sickness simply does not know the Bible. One must be cautious not to believe something just because it seems logical to a natural man. Sometimes the most logical conclusions are nothing more than Satan's lies, Isaiah 55 verse 8. 1 Corinthians 2.14, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. This is the end of chapter 27. Chapter 28, Apostles, Prophets, Evangelists, Pastors, and Teachers. No doubt many Bible-believing Christians have received warnings concerning dispensationalism. This is understandable since with every true teaching there are schisms and varied approaches, some right and some wrong. While we should all strive to be right, no one person or group of preachers has a monopoly upon the full truth. This means that we must find an appropriate balance in how we view any teaching. Unfortunately, some people have used dispensational teaching concepts to twist the scripture by teaching man-made philosophies that have a basis in scripture but lack the necessary scriptural substance. Each of us must learn how to identify such teachings and avoid the pitfalls associated to any false teaching. One reason some have warned against dispensationalism is that they believe Bible study, at least in-depth Bible study, is not an essential for the Christian walk. After all, many believe soul winning should receive one soul focus. Again, that type of thinking is unbalanced because we are commanded to study to gain God's approval. 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved in the God, a workman needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. This mindset of diminished study and teaching has invalidated much of the needed emphasis upon discipleship. Some might even repeat cliches such as dispensationalism never led a soul to Christ or dispensationalism never built a church. Some have gone so far as to conclude that dispensationalism hinders people from truly knowing and doing God's will. This teaching really implies that one can have too much truth to be effective for the Lord. None of this is true. Truth makes one free. And nobody has ever been too heavenly minded to be any earthly good. Truth does not enslave the believer or hinder the student's Christian walk. John 8:32. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Learning how to rightly divide the word of truth is helpful on several fronts. In fact, failure to learn the truths of rightly dividing has allowed many precious souls, one to Christ and Bible-believing churches, to become the newest converts to the plethora of cults. Many cults are filled with those who got saved, but nobody ever invested in their spiritual growth. Most cults are led by and driven by men and women, usurping biblical authority not belonging to them. This becomes especially clear when study of Scripture indicates that the positions many of them claim to hold were intended for other periods. Therefore, every Christian should strive to know and understand God's will and plan for man today. What does God want to accomplish through the New Testament church? 
The Bible records God's dealings with man in the past and gives explicit instructions for the present and for the future. The Bible provides specific instructions for conducting ongoing local church operations. For instance, Paul's letter to Timothy identified two offices of the New Testament church, bishop and deacon. While it's not the purpose of this book to delve deeply into the two offices mentioned, one should note that God's purpose for the bishop is quite different from that of the deacon, and the two should complement the work of each other. 1 Timothy 3.1 This is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. 1 Timothy 3.10 And let those also first be proved, let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. Yet, in addition to these two offices, the scriptures clearly address additional offices, and it is these additional offices causing the greatest confusion among believers today. Some of the confusion revolves around the office of a prophet and an apostle. As it pertains to the study of New Testament callings, authority, positions, roles, and transitions of such, Ephesians chapter 4 offers a good starting point. God identified the five gifts he gave to the New Testament church. Ephesians 4.10 And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. After mentioning the five gifts of the church, the passage continues by identifying the purpose of these five gifts, verse 12, followed by God's desired collective purpose for them, verse 13. Ephesians 4.12, Ephesians 4.12, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. In order to simplify the truths found in this passage, consider God's plan for the church as a 531 ministry. Five callings, Ephesians 4.11, threefold purpose, Ephesians 4.12, one desired end, Ephesians 4.13, a 5.3.1 ministry. To grasp the importance of these gifts or callings, one should consider two truths found within the subject passage. Number one, the use of the word some shows that not everyone is promised the gift of each of these callings. And two, the callings progressively transition from apostles and prophets and evangelists onto pastors and teachers. The most important point is to notice the progression moves away from apostles and prophets, while those who served in these two offices served specific purposes during the church's early formation. The completion of the canon of Scripture eliminated any need for apostles and prophets as an ongoing ministry for the established church. In fact, only one apostle was ever replaced to keep the original twelve intact. Judas died, leaving the twelve with only eleven, so Matthias replaced Judas as one of the twelve. There is no record in Scripture or in history that any other apostle was replaced upon death. We also know that the original work of the evangelist, taking the gospel to areas where the gospel had yet to be taken, was accomplished before the completion of the canon of Scripture, Colossians 1, 5, and 6. This evangelistic calling in future generations seemingly also became incorporated into a primary responsibility of the pastors or teachers. Paul, writing to Timothy, the pastor, wrote, Do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry, 2 Timothy 4, 5. One thing we know for sure is that pastors, which can be used interchangeably with the term overseer, bishop, or elder, and teachers remain an ongoing gift given to the churches today. While it appears that all pastors are to be gifted as teachers, 1 Timothy 3, 2, not all teachers serve as pastors, Acts 13, 1. Certainly the Bible student's responsibility is to find the scriptural practice for the present. To do so, we must determine the impact each of these groups might offer within the church today. God gave each group a particular assignment. Therefore, these offices differ based upon their particular functions. Romans 12.4, For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. The chart on page 414 is titled New Testament Offices and Gifts. Apostles. Both apostles and his disciples were present during the Lord's earthly ministry. Each group performed their own distinct functions, meaning that the terms apostle and disciple are not synonymous. In fact, out of a larger body of men identified as disciples, the Lord chose twelve to occupy the position of apostle. Luke 6.13 And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose twelve, whom he also named apostles. The differences between disciple and apostle are easily distinguishable since the term disciple indicates one who is a student and the term apostle identifies one who is sent. 
As simple and clear as this truth may seem, much confusion exists in understanding the biblical concept of an apostleship. Most Bible teachers realize that those called to be apostles served in a temporary capacity prior to the formation of the New Testament church and then continued into the church's earliest days. Unfortunately, there are those who claim that someone can be an apostle today. This is not the case. Adding to the confusion are those who understand the meaning of missionary as one sent on a mission. The modern-day missionary is not simply an extension of the apostles which laid the foundational work of the early church. Most Bible believers recognize that a missionary is not an apostle, but one sent out by the church for a specific purpose. Granted, the two words are similar in meaning, but this does not infer parity of office. Bible students must never be guilty of twisting the scriptures in order to support preconceived notions. Rather, one should always be willing to modify his position to fit the teachings of Scripture. We need to be both scriptural and consistent in elevating the authority of Scripture as our sole and definitive guide for all truth. Because of the confusion, it is important to ascertain what the Bible specifically teaches concerning apostles. First, it is important to distinguish between the two lines of apostles. Number one, the twelve, and then number two, the others, those with a specific calling for a specific purpose but not included in the twelve. Other than those who incorrectly teach that Paul was God's choice to replace Judas rather than Matthias, the makeup of the twelve apostles has widespread agreement. It is important to note that Paul was not chosen, nor did he qualify to become one of the twelve. The first grouping of apostles, the twelve, includes thirteen men, twelve original apostles, and one replacement for the fallen apostle Judas Iscariot. Numerous passages refer to each one of the twelve apostles by name. Number one, Simon called Peter. Two, Andrew, Simon's brother. Three, James, the son of Zebedee. Four, John, the brother of James. Five, Philip. Six, Bartholomew. Seven, Thomas. Eight, Matthew, the publican. Nine, James, the son of Alphaeus. Ten, Labius, surnamed Thaddeus, also called Judas, brother of James. Eleven, Simon, the Canaanite, also called Zelotes and 12, the 12th apostle, which originally was Judas Iscariot, and then replaced by Matthias. The Bible identifies this group as the 12 apostles, originally including Judas, followed by Matthias, becoming the 12th. The book of Revelation also references the names of the 12 apostles written in the foundations of the great city, the holy Jerusalem, which descends from God out of heaven. Revelation 21:14. The wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. The makeup of this city necessitates replacing Judas. God certainly would not approve of Judas's name to be placed upon one of the twelve foundations. Interestingly, the Bible only offers specific qualifications for this group of twelve apostles and only mentions the qualifications for replacement once it became necessary to find a replacement for Judas. The reason no qualifications are provided for the other apostles is because Judas was the only apostle ever replaced. In fact, the initial group of apostles were the only ones who fulfilled the qualifications of an apostle, although they did not even fulfill the second qualification until after they had already been chosen. The truths associated to Judas's replacement offer some fascinating insights. Judas was replaced as a fulfillment of Old Testament scripture, Psalm 109.8, Acts 1, 20 through 26, and Apparently, only two men of the 120 in the upper room, who were not already apostles, fulfilled the qualifications. Joseph called Barsabas and surnamed Justice, and Matthias, Acts 1.23. This second point provides crucial insights into the circumstances surrounding this group of apostles. Number one, all men qualified to be apostles were not chosen to become apostles. And number two, there were only a few men in the initial group who were qualified to replace Judas. Additionally, this first category of apostles, the twelve apostles, never rose above the number twelve, although both Joseph and Matthias qualified. Scripture, history, and logic show that the number gradually decreased as the twelve died, and God chose no replacements. The other apostles. The second group or category, others, tends to be the more controversial area where good men tend to disagree. For instance, there are scriptures which do not definitively declare that an individual is an apostle. These include Andronicus and Junia, Romans 16.7, Timotheus and Sylvanius, compare 1 Thessalonians 2.6 with 1 Thessalonians 1.1, 1, 1, and Apollos, compare 1 Corinthians 4.9 with 1 Corinthians 4.6. 
Although the previous verses are not definitive, it is likely that some of these five were apostles. Yet the Bible mentions four other men, which the Bible explicitly places in the second category of apostles, each with a unique apostleship. James, the Lord's brother, Galatians 1.19. Barnabas, not part of the twelve, Acts 4.36, Acts 9.27, but called an apostle nonetheless, Acts 14.14. 14. Paul, Romans 11.13, and the Lord Jesus Christ, Hebrews 3.1. The truths concerning the other apostles offer some interesting insights. They were not required to meet the qualifications mentioned for Judas's replacement. They were never replaced, and there were never any expressed qualifications given for their apostleship because they were chosen of God and never replaced. To get a biblical understanding of apostleship in general, one must consider several distinct features serving as general rules. Number one, the special calling. A man, regardless of which group of apostles, did not choose an apostleship, but the Lord chose each of them for their position or office. Number two, the special qualifications. As it pertained to the call to join the twelve apostles and their apostleship, there were specific qualifications to be met, and not all men that met those qualifications were chosen by God to be an apostle. The other apostles had special callings, but no qualifications were ever specifically delineated in Scripture because no replacements ever existed. And the special confirmation. The signs of an apostle followed those called to be apostles. The call to an apostleship was unique as it pertained to the New Testament offices and in many ways paralleled the call of an Old Testament prophet. Scripture never points to an apostle being appointed by a church or some individual. Even Matthias's appointment was determined by the Lord. The lot used to choose Judas's replacement shows that it was God, not man, who ultimately chose the apostles. Acts 1.24 and they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of men, show whether these two thou hast chosen. When studying the appointment of the apostles, the word ordained proves to be most intriguing. Concerning the twelve apostles, the Bible says he, that is Jesus, ordained twelve, that they should be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach, Mark 3.14. And Matthias, Judas's replacement, was ordained to be a witness with us, that is the eleven apostles, of his that is the Savior's resurrection, Acts 1.22. Paul likewise claimed a special calling when he said, I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, 1 Timothy 2.7. Each of the apostles was ordained. No man assumed the role of apostleship without a known calling and approval from the Lord. In fact, this is likely one of the reasons why it appears that Paul's apostleship was so often questioned. As demonstrated later, men were not to be accepted by believers as apostles merely because they claimed an apostleship. In fact, John wrote to the church at Ephesus and praised them because they had tried them, which say they are apostles and are not, and has found them liars. Revelation 2.2 2. Verbal claim to an apostleship was insufficient. God gave some level of confirmation that verified or disproved a man's claim to an apostleship. The call by God to apostleship was unique and a necessary factor for qualification. In fact, this was the only qualification for every apostle. Unfortunately, most Bible teachers have taught incorrectly concerning the qualifications of apostleship. For instance, the qualifications for apostleship listed in Acts chapter 1 only apply to the twelve apostles because God never intended for the other apostles to be replaced upon their deaths. For this reason, he never outlined the qualifications for choosing replacements for those outside the twelve. Only when it came time for that one replacement pertaining to Judas's bishopric was any apostle replaced. The scriptures set forth the specific and binding qualifications for that particular replacement. Acts 1.20, For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his habitation be desolate, let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric let another take. Wherefore of these men, which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John, unto the same day when he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. It is important to allow the scripture to say what God intended for it to say, and sometimes this means ignoring deeply ingrained misconceptions. According to the passage, Judas's replacement was specifically required to have been an eyewitness of two events, the baptism of John, most likely referring to John's baptism of Jesus, and two, the ascension of Jesus Christ into heaven. The second one may shock many of the readers because so many have misread the passage. 
Additionally, Judas' replacement had to accompany with the apostles all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among them. Acts 1.21, the whole period covered by the two defined stipulations. Only two men among the believers met these requirements, John and Matthias, and only one of those men would be chosen to become an apostle as part of the twelve. Unfortunately, most Christians have erroneously been taught concerning the qualifications listed in Acts 1.22, thinking that the man merely had to be an eyewitness of the resurrected Christ. Understandably, some have taught it necessary to use this argument to justify that Paul met this main qualification. Interestingly, proving that Paul even saw the actual resurrected Christ is not quite as easy to prove as one might think. In fact, Paul never testified that he specifically saw the literal form of the resurrected Christ on the road to Damascus. Paul said he heard the Lord's voice, but saw only a light. Yet, there are scriptures which indicate that Paul saw the resurrected form of Christ and was an eyewitness of the resurrected Christ. For instance, consider these passages. Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, Acts 9.17. For I have appeared unto thee, Acts 26, 16. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? 1 Corinthians 9, 1. And last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time, 1 Corinthians 15, 8. The Bible student who carefully reads Acts 1, 22 will see that the man was to be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. In other words, if the replacement for Judas met the qualifications accompanying Christ and the apostles beginning at the baptism of John through Christ's ascension, this replacement was to be ordained to witness, ordained to preach or testify to others of Christ's resurrection. Almost all Christians have misread the qualifications, believing the Bible to teach that being a witness of the resurrection was an apostolic qualification rather than the apostolic commission. The apostles were ordained for a specific purpose. Paul was not present for the baptism of John, nor for the ascension, nor did he accompany the Lord his entire three-year earthly ministry. Fortunately, there's no indication that the qualifications given in Acts chapter 1 extended beyond the twelve apostles. Paul's perceived lack of qualifications and calling often caused his apostleship to be called into question. 1 Corinthians 9, 1. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you, for the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. Paul was less concerned with pe Paul was less concerned with people questioning his apostleship because of a misunderstanding of the requirements of Acts 1, 20 through 22. He was more concerned with what he deemed made his apostleship questionable. He persecuted the church of God. 1 Corinthians 15, 9. For I am the least of the apostles, then am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. The misrepresentation of the qualifications of Paul's apostleship, forcing Paul to fit within the Acts chapter 1 parameters, has created a need for deception among the charismatic leaders. Many televangelists have boasted of a visit from the Savior to validate, quote-unquote, their false claims of being an apostle. Yet even their claims can be easily debunked with the following passages. 2 Corinthians 5.16 Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. 2 Corinthians 11.14 And no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. No man knows Christ after the flesh, however Satan desires to deceive, and will use such means to garner a following around some self-proclaimed apostle. These men or women are either lying or their visions are nothing more than a glimpse of a satanic transformation. Regretfully, many people are duped into believing that some well-known televangelist has been visited by Jesus and heard him speak. One preacher claimed that a 900-foot tall Jesus appeared to him. This Jesus told him that he should speak to his ministry partners to give more money so that he could complete his city of faith. This same charismatic preacher later claimed that God appeared to him and had given him 12 months to raise $8 million or he was going to die. Unfortunately, someone gave him the money. Interestingly, Joseph Smith, founder of the Mormons or the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, claims to have been visited by the angel Moroni. Furthermore, the Mormon webpage lists 100 members that make up the apostles in the Quorum of the Twelve. When Satan sees the opportunity to deceive, he gladly obliges those looking for power and position regardless of the truth. Review 
A little review is necessary before moving forward. Many people today claim an unprovable calling to an apostleship which ceased to exist, and they twist the qualifications of apostleship, which none can meet. To complete the perfected trifecta, they then claim to manifest the special confirmation of apostleship, the signs of an apostle. 2 Corinthians 12.12, 12, Truly the signs of an apostle wrought among you in all patience, in signs, and wonders, and mighty deeds. 2 Corinthians 12.12, 12, Truly the signs of an apostle wrought among you in all patience, and signs, and wonders, and mighty deeds. Previous chapters have sufficiently covered the sign gifts, negating the necessity of further explanation here. Yet the vast perversions by most religious television personalities necessitates exploring further the signs of an apostle. These signs of an apostle were clearly given to the apostles, both during the ministry of Christ and immediately thereafter. The scripture specifically identifies these signs of an apostle as casting out devils, speaking with new tongues, taking up serpents, immunity poison, and laying hands on the sick to recover. Mark 16, 14. Afterward he appeared unto the eleven, and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them, they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. Although many preachers, teachers, and churches are confused concerning the signs in Mark chapter 16, these are directly related to the signs of an apostle as referenced in 2 Corinthians 12, 12, and thus tied directly to the ministries of the apostles. Equally important to recognize is that the ministries of the apostles were directly tied to the sign gifts. Their rise and fading away occurred in the first century. As each apostle died, the sign gifts associated to his apostleship died out with him too. In fact, as was determined earlier in this work, the sign gifts ended somewhere around A.D. 66, even before the final apostles died. Note, we can know for sure that the signs of an apostle ceased before the end of the first century, A.D. 100. Before concluding this discussion, another issue must be addressed. Some have claimed a special ministry to the Gentile church today. Unfortunately for these deceivers, the Lord identified Paul as the apostle of the Gentiles. In other words, that office belonged to Paul alone. Romans 11:13. For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of Gentiles, I magnify mine office. No one can legitimately claim to be a replacement for one of the twelve, as they were not to be replaced. No individual today even meets the requirements. Additionally, no man can claim to be an apostle of the Gentiles, because that was Paul's office for a special purpose at a specific juncture in time. He was not to be replaced. This explains why no qualifications were given for the position of apostleship of the Gentiles. There was only to be one. Surely Timothy or Titus would have been prime candidates for this office because their ministries followed the Apostle Paul, and they were some of the earliest known pastors and teachers. In other words, there are no apostles today. All those who claim to be an apostle today reveal their true identities, false apostles. The chart on page 423 is titled, The Apostles versus False Apostles. 2 Corinthians 11.13 For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. The scripture leaves no room for private interpretation. Those claiming to hold the office of an apostleship err not knowing the scriptures. These false apostles are deserving of God's judgment and condemnation. Now attention focuses upon another office abused by those who seek to usurp authority not belonging to them, that of the prophet. Prophets. Quite simply, the work of the prophet was to prophesy. Yet not everyone who prophesied in the scripture was specifically identified as holding the office of a prophet. To define the scope of a prophet's work, some have generically identified the work of a prophet as nothing more than that of preaching. Fortunately, the scripture is the determining factor, not man's suppositions or biases. Based upon the teachings of scripture, a prophet was a seer or one who sees, 1 Samuel 9.9. 9. In other words, he or she received a word from the Lord that was not commonly known as yet. 
In fact, in one place, the Lord pointed out that he would make himself known to a prophet in a vision or a dream, Numbers 12, 6. The prophet who saw the newly revealed word from God would then stand and proclaim, Thus saith the Lord God, Judges 6, 8. These truths are further confirmed in other scriptures. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealed his secret unto his servants, the prophets, Amos 3, 7. The Old Testament prophets, like the apostles, received newly revealed truths from the Lord and delivered those truths to God's intended audience. Oftentimes this duty was accomplished by the spoken word, many times becoming the written word. Like the apostles of the New Testament, these prophets often incorporate signs and wonders to confirm their spoken words. In a basic sense, every Old Testament writer was a prophet. Attesting to this truth is the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ divided the Old Testament into the Law and the Prophets, or Moses and the Prophets, Matthew 5.17, 7.12, 11.13, 12.40, Luke 16.29, and 31, 24.27, and John 1.45. Additionally, Moses was also identified as a prophet, Deuteronomy 18.15 and 18, Deuteronomy 34.10. These practical truths make sense, but more importantly, they are scriptural. There are two primary areas where the prophets separate themselves from the apostles in their sheer numbers and their classes of participants. Unlike the apostles, both men and women prophesied. Additionally, the number of the apostles was limited, whereas the number of prophets was much larger, with a greater number of them never even identified by name. While much is known and understood concerning the work of Old Testament prophets, the early New Testament church operations also employed the use of prophets. In principle, the apostles were prophets, Matthew 10:41. Furthermore, Peter declared a partial fulfillment of Joel's prophecy with sons and daughters of Israel prophesying, Acts 2, 17 and 18. Acts also records the actions of the early church prophets, some which were named in various chapters of Acts, Acts eleven twenty seven. And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch, and there stood up one of them named Agabus, signified by the Spirit that there should be a great dearth throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Acts 13.1 Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Mananean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. Acts 15.32 And Judas and Silas, being prophets also themselves, exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. Acts 19.6 when Paul laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, certain disciples in verse 1, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Acts 21, 8, And the next day we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the Evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, who did prophesy. And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. The astute Bible student immediately notes the time frame in which these events occurred. The event in Acts chapter 11 and 13 took place after Acts chapter 9, where Paul gets saved, but before Paul's first missionary journey, Acts chapter 13. The account given in Acts chapter 15 occurred during Paul's second missionary journey. It was on this missionary journey that Paul wrote First and Second Corinthians, First and Second Thessalonians, and Romans. The circumstances of Acts chapters 19 and 21 occurred during Paul's third missionary journey and before his first Roman imprisonment. The timing is important because each of these occurrences took place before things changed after Paul's imprisonment. Those readers who have read the Signs and Wonders chapter are not surprised to find a similar setting taking place with the ministry of the prophets. The position eventually faded into non-existence. In fact, only one verse written during Paul's initial Roman imprisonment or thereafter mentions prophets in the present tense, and that is Ephesians 3, 5, in relation to the revelation of previously unrevealed truths. Much like the sign gifts, it is likely the ministry of the prophets was coming to an end as early as A.D. 66, but certainly prior to A.D. 100. In fact, Simon Peter noted a shift in emphasis from prophecy to the Word of God when he wrote, 2 Peter 1, 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn, the day star rise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. 
It is important to realize that Paul's missionary epistles plainly speak of prophesying and prophets in a positive light. In fact, Romans 12, 6 declares that anyone with the gift of prophecy should prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Likewise, 1 Thessalonians 5, 20 warns despise not prophesying. Paul's first recorded epistle to the Corinthian believers spoke more of prophecy than any other epistle. Considering the emphasis placed upon prophesying in 1 Corinthians, one should note the shift in focus to the rules of a prophet within the operation of the infant church. The scriptures give at least four specific guidelines that every New Testament prophet was to follow in the early church. Any prophet that did not abide by these four parameters was out of the will of God and not obedient to God. 1 Corinthians 14, 29, let the prophets speak two or three and let the other judge. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. For ye may all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be comforted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all the churches of the saints. Four biblical rules for a prophet. Number one, only two prophets, or at most three, were to speak in the church service. Verse 29. Number two, the other prophets were to judge whether the prophet speaking was of God. Verse 29. The applicable scriptural principle is clear. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. First John 4.1. Number three, the prophets were only to speak one at a time and were to allow the next prophet to speak when he was ready, verses 30 and 31. Number four, the spirits of the prophets were subject to the prophets, e.g. under their control. The claim today that God causes a person to lose control of his or her spirit is completely unscriptural. For instance, God had nothing to do with the so-called laughing revival where people claimed to lose control of themselves. It was simply a satanic delusion, verse 32. They were deceived or had another spirit, 2 Corinthians 11, 4. These other spirits can and do work miracles, but are the spirits of devils, Revelation 16, 14. The restrictions placed upon prophesying demonstrate God's narrowing usage of the gift itself, along with man's propensity to pervert that which God intended for good. No doubt prophecy was absolutely necessary for the first century church, since the word of God as a completed form had not yet been given to man. Going forward, God's prophets likely continued to prophesy until the word of God was complete, although there is not much record of such when Paul became a prisoner in Rome. In fact, 1 Corinthians states that prophecy would fail in the future. 1 Corinthians 13, 8, Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Since the Bible warned that prophecies shall fail, every Bible student should seek to determine the time frame in which this would occur. The text in 1 Corinthians also provides the context. When Paul authored 1 Corinthians, he testified we prophesy in part. The gift of prophecy was only intended to be temporary and would fail when that which is perfect is come. Likely the combination of the maturation of the church and the completed canon of scripture. At that point, man no longer knew in part or prophesied in part. Think about it from another perspective. When man received the completed prophecy, the 66 books of the Bible, he would no longer have only part of the prophecy. The chart on page 428 is titled Prophecy in Part. Evangelist. If we apply the same logic to the office of an evangelist as that applied to the offices of apostle and prophet, we could conclude that the position of evangelist is now fulfilled by the pastor or teacher, 2 Timothy 4, 5. Unfortunately, the position of evangelist is the most difficult office to grasp of those mentioned in Ephesians 4, 11 because of its minimal mention in Scripture. For instance, the Old Testament never mentions evangelists, limiting the position to a New Testament office. However, the New Testament offers little information since it only references evangelists three times. While no specifics are given in any of the passages using the word evangelist, the efforts of the one man the scripture specifically identified as an evangelist, Philip, should provide some insight. This Philip was not one of the apostles, but was one of the seven. Acts 21.8, see also Acts 6.5. When the apostles remained in Jerusalem after the Lord told them to disperse, Philip was one who went everywhere preaching the word, Acts 8, 4. 
He is found in Samaria where he preached Christ unto them, Acts 8, 5, with the accompaniment of miracles and signs, Acts 8, 13. Philip's time there was apparently not intended to be long term as Peter and John were sent there to further the work, Acts 8, 14 through 17. Philip's next stop was dictated by the angel of the Lord to be toward the south under the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, Acts 8, 26. There Philip was able to witness to an Ethiopian eunuch and win him to the Lord, Acts 8, 29 through 39. And from there the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, Acts 8, 39. And he was found at Azotus and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea, Acts 8, 40. Caesarea seems to be the location where Philip settled down, as that is where Paul visited Philip when his daughters prophesied to Paul about his demise awaiting him in Jerusalem, Acts 21, 8, 9. Historically, the word evangelist was thought to mean good messenger or the messenger who brought good news. That certainly applies to the work Philip accomplished, but surely there was more to it. Or is there? Scripturally speaking, the word evangelist is found in Ephesians 4.11, where the offices or positions of the New Testament were listed. It is also found once in Acts 21.8, referring to Philip, and once in 2 Timothy, when Paul commanded Timothy to do the work of an evangelist, 2 Timothy 4.5. The scriptural references do not discount the historical definition provided, but this still does not completely resolve the issue of identifying the office itself. Trying to find the balance can be quite troublesome. Some have suggested that the position of evangelist is a broad term meant to include all who take the good news from place to place. Others have suggested that an evangelist is specifically commissioned to move about and evangelize the lost and plant churches before being replaced by the pastor or teacher once this is accomplished. Both mindsets would say the position of evangelist is one that continues into the present church age. Others might see something quite different in the scripture and suggest that the position of evangelist, although only specifically assigned to one man by name, Acts 21.8, was held by a small number of men, see evangelist in Ephesians 4.11, and once their ministries were completed, the work was to be taken up in each of the succeeding ages by the pastor or teacher. It is difficult to be dogmatic concerning this matter. Regardless of whether the position of evangelist is ongoing, pastors and teachers are instructed to take up the work of an evangelist and shame on any pastor or teacher that fails in this important area. Pastors and Teachers The foundational pieces of the New Testament church building upon the Lord Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 3.11, consisted of the apostles and prophets, Ephesians 2.20. This foundation is obvious. The entirety of the scripture was written by prophets and apostles. Note, the only question of the New Testament author would be Luke, who was not specifically designated as an apostle. Although he was never identified as an apostle, it would be likely that he would have fit the mold of a prophet. Number one, the apostles and prophets were recipients of the revelation of the mystery of Christ. Ephesians 3, 4, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Number two, the Apostle Peter referenced the words and commandments by the prophets and apostles. Second Peter 3, 1 Peter 3.1 This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Number three, the book of Acts refers to the reading of the law and the prophets. Acts 13, 15, And after reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. Number four, Paul referred to the Old Testament as the voices of the prophets. Acts 13, 27, For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning them. Number five, Paul referred to the scriptures of the prophets. Romans 16, 26, And now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. God indisputably laid the foundation of the church upon the apostles and prophets. By revelation, he gave his word through these messengers to fill temporary positions. These holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, 2 Peter 1, 21. Peter declared that the written scripture became a more sure word of prophecy, 2 Peter 1.19, versus simply an audible voice from God. 
the scripture spoken and eventually recorded by the prophets and the apostles would become the authority for the pastors and teachers, Titus 1 9. Similar to the apostles, there were qualifications given for those seeking the office of a pastor, bishop, or elder. 1 Timothy 3 1 through 7, Titus 1 7 through 9. One of these qualifications was that the man of God was to be apt to teach, 1 Timothy 3 2. He was to have an aptitude to teach. While every pastor was to be a capable teacher, every teacher was not necessarily to seek the office of a bishop. Those who malign teachers of God's word are doing damage to God's intended growth of the church. Messages from the pulpit do need to be evangelistic, but if believers remain spiritually immature, they will be spiritually tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Erring in this area is dangerous because many Christians have been kept captive by the cults who deceive the carefree and careless Christians. Ephesians 4.14, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Those who praise Paul but bash teachers need to remember that Paul was a teacher, Acts 13.1. The idea that preachers must yell, stomp, snort, and sweat profusely, or they are not preaching, reflects a cultural interpretation of the scripture. Those who have accepted culture as the authority are often the same group demonizing Bible teachers. The attack on Bible teachers and Bible teaching has taken its toll upon the churches. Church buildings now echo with shallow messages, producing shallow and ignorant attendees who are easily carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they, the deceivers, lie in wait to deceive. The only way to thwart the slide into oblivion and apostasy is the reinvigoration of pastors willing to study to become teaching pastors. Churches must consider returning to our biblical roots and only appointing capable men to the office of a Bible teacher. Christianity needs to turn away from the self-proclaimed apostles and prophets which have done so much damage to the cause of Christ. What we need are true men called of God willing to sacrifice temporal pleasures of this world to be highly esteemed by the Savior. This is the end of chapter 28.